live in an hour, 10 o'clock. Uh, I'm going to talk about... Okay, this is here. I'm going to talk about some of the wild foods you can forage now, specifically things that we can incorporate into a salad that you can find in your garden perhaps, or they're just very common. Um, I'm just getting the fire ready because I'm going to cook some things as well. Uh, it's kind of interesting what I'm going to cook because I've been kind of raiding the cupboards for supplies and combining some kind of quite unusual things. So, yeah, this should have burnt down to some nice hot embers in about an hour. And uh, I'll see you then. I don't know. I'm going to remember, by the way, when I did this last one on Monday, I deleted the whole hour and a half uh, video. So this is good practice for me. I'm going to find out how not to delete it afterwards so I can put it on um, YouTube and Facebook. So I'll see you later. Welcome back. Can you hear me uh, from there? Let me just check. Yeah, can you just do a sound check? Can you can you hear me? I'll come and check. So in my second uh, live video, I deleted the whole last one, which was slightly annoying. Um, who can hear me? Can you hear me? Could you hear me from sitting back there? That's the question. Thumbs up. I guess that's. Okay, so, quite ambitious today. Um, I had an idea of going out for a walk foraging and then I realised that uh, anything more than about 10 metres from the house, I've got no connection for the time being. It's normally okay, but just these last couple of days. So, I went out and got some salad things, which we can look at in detail. I've got them kind of lined up there. And, uh, I'll show you them, them clearly. These are very common things and, um, and also some things that are kind of quite common but uh, I guess sometimes what's common as a wild plant is different by region. So what's common for me might not be so common for you and vice versa. And I've also looked at a few garden plants that can, can, can be eaten as well, which is kind of nice. Um, and I'm going to do some cooking on, on, on a fire, which is actually a late breakfast for me. So um, the wonderful thing about wild foods is that the flavours are so lovely. And actually, even if it's kind of new to you, uh, yeah, make, make, as long as it's edible um, and, you know, it's a tradition of being eaten. Yeah, make sure you're really hungry the first time you try it, because then you're going to love it. It's going to be a good experience for you and you want to do it again. Um, it's a bit of a joke, but... Um, it's true. So, let's start. Oh yeah, no, one other thing I'd like to say actually is I belong to a group, a wonderful group, called the Association of Foragers. And we've got an online website and I know many of my friends and colleagues in this group are over, over this time where people are in self-isolation and it's not so easy. Well, it's, it might be easy to, to get out, but you're on your own. So actually the perfect opportunity to forage, if you can, if you've got a garden or if you can get out in, in the country. Um, and they're also posting lots of videos about um, plants that you can forage. So uh, lots of lots of useful stuff out there. And I'll also be talking about um, some other online resources that you can use. Um, that, that smoke from that fire is getting to me. Um, it's going to be a case of wherever I sit, it's going to come. You know, the smoke, that's what happens. That's the, that's the eternal law. Um, so yeah, online resources. Um, I'll talk you through some, some useful books as well. In fact, I'll probably do a whole session on that, but just a couple today that are relevant to some of the things that I picked. Um, and partly the reason I'll do that is because I picked some salad leaves and sometimes, I mean, this is how it was for me when I started foraging, is I had wildflower guides because I found it was easier to identify 
plants when they're in, in flower. Um, and that's not always how you want them to be when you're picking for a salad. It's at a younger stage. So the reason I got this book, so I can show you what they are look like now and give you a, a kind of hint at what they might look like if you're more familiar with seeing them uh, in flower. So I think we've got about 10 items. No, maybe not. Maybe not that many. About eight, uh, six, seven, eight, I know, items for salad today. And we're going to cook with dock leaves, which for me is, um, is it pushing it too far to say exciting? It is exciting for me because I really love to use plants which are, you know, perfectly edible, but tend to get ignored and also work with things that are so common that perhaps you might not have thought of using. So I'll show you really specifically how to work with that plant and I'll be cooking with that too. Um, so just before I start, I can see if there's any questions. I like questions by the way. And what I intend to do this time, if I save it, um, uh, is that um, I'll go through the questions and I'll ask them later. Because I'm going to post this to YouTube, I can also attach links to relevant articles and links that I've spoken about, which I think would be useful if I can do that. Uh, but yeah, if you do have any questions, I'll, I'll come and check every now and then. I don't want it to kind of really interrupt what I'm doing, saying too much, but I will try. So yeah, they are welcome. Very welcome. Oh, I'm going to stop touching this because it's not good. This will cut you off. Right. By the way, be happy. So, the first plant that I've got, I'm just going to, I've, I've washed all these. The good thing about doing this in advance is that I could gather things around and I could kind of wash them all, which is kind of important when you're gathering wild plants. But, you know, I mean, some of the things I picked, like hawthorn leaves, which were quite high up, and we'll talk about those in a minute. I haven't washed those, but uh, I have washed pretty much everything else. So... Uh, let's see. Right, let's start with something which is a wonderful plant to gather and where I am in East Sussex you don't see it around that much and it's this one and it's called navel wart or penny wart and the reason you don't see it around so much is it tends to like to grow more around kind of Wales, the southwest, uh, Devon, Cornwall in kind of old walls, kind of dry stone walls and, and things like that, and quite kind of often quite damp locations. So I'll kind of show you that. Isn't that lovely? And the other thing I've done today, which I wouldn't normally do at all, is that I've just pulled a whole cluster out of the wall. And the, the reason I've done that is just so I could show you the whole plant. Um, rather than just an isolated leaf, which is kind of important when you're thinking about the general appearance of a plant in terms of identification. So there's a, there's a kind of little one. It's almost like there's something uh, fungal about it, isn't there? You see that? You've seen that before? So this is a plant in, for, from the point of view of using as a salad. It's really nice because um, it's not huge on flavour, but what it's really huge on is kind of moisture, really. It's, a, it's really almost kind of, almost seems like a succulent plant. So no, you probably don't want me to get really close so you can hear that. But, hmm, it, it's just bursting with moisture. Oh, actually, it's not true that it, it, it doesn't have much flavour. I guess it's not a strong flavour. It definitely does have a flavour. So that's pennywort or navel wart. And what I'll do is also when I, I, I'll, I'll put links to everything I've talked about. In fact, I'm going to say this right now. The links that I, I will put each plant I, I talk about is, a, is from a really, really wonderful online resource um, called Plants for a Future. Now, some of you would have come across that. And, but I would highly recommend it. And the reason why 
is it's a kind of database of about 7,000 odd plants. Odd, not in a sense of peculiar, but whatever that other sense is, you know what I mean. Um, that generally aren't used as food, or well, some are, in, in particularly cross-culturally and, you know, and maybe historically, but not now. But anyway, they, they could be. And the, the reason it's so wonderful is it's really well laid out. Um, it has uh, good illustrations, not for all plants, but for a lot of them. But the, the key thing is, it it's very well referenced to its source that it quotes. So it will give you a description of a plant, where it grows. It will say the edible parts used, um, where, how, referenced. Um, key thing, it will say any contraindications that you need to be aware of. Um, yeah, in, in, ter in terms of perhaps compounds that are in there that need that that need to be a kind of be aware of that perhaps, perhaps with cooking can be um, reduced or got rid of to make the plant safe, or just to be aware of if you, the chemicals that might be in there that if you have a particular medical condition or something. But also the other thing when when we think about wild food plants, um, or wild plants, you know, a lot of them both double as food and medicine. So you can, looking at this site, as I um, mentioned, just in case you're, you're joining us here, if you've joined, um, it's called Plants for the Future. It also has uh, herbal usage, which is really useful, very, very useful. So check that out, Plants for the Future. So navel wart, it has a tender stem as well as a tender leaf. So you can use the whole lot in salad. And I guess you could, you know, it's like anything, you could probably, I've never cooked with this to be honest, you probably could, like tempura it might be nice, uh, but it's going in a salad, so that's our first plant. Navel wart. Got some, got some more here. Actually, let me just show you, let me just show you a range of sizes. It's kind of almost... It doesn't quite have the vein structure of a, I mean, it has not, and I mean, I can see veins in there, but it's not really distinct veins. Um, I was going to say it's a little bit like nasturtium, but then I was thinking in terms of shape, certainly, but um, it's, it's less veiny and much, much, much more succulent than a nasturtium, which is something I meant to put in a salad today, but I, I forgot. Um, they're growing in the conservatory, just kind of naturally growing, but it doesn't matter. We've got loads of tasty things. That's the first one. Now the next one is oxide daisy. And I'm going to show you the difference between oxide daisy and common daisy. Now both are edible. And I had some more somewhere. Oh, I can't see. So so oxide daisy, here's the leaf of oxide daisy. It just grows in, in my garden as a kind of wild plant. Leaf very distinctive, eh? Distinctive shape compared to common daisy. That's a little plus. We all know what common daisy is and the daisy's about that big. Now oxide daisy is an interesting one because I remember when I first, you know, started using it. I wasn't really noticing it in leaf. It was one of those, and this is why when I, when I really started foraging like years ago now, I, I worked with wild flower guides initially to identify plants, is I would notice this. It just wouldn't kind of register on, on in my kind of consciousness until more like, I would say, yeah, May, June, particularly like driving along busy roads, roadsides, um, bit, yeah, the sides of busy road, motorways even. And you can just see like, Oh, it's actually gorgeous. Like the, the whole bank sometimes just brightened with these these cheery big uh, white daisies. So you think we think of like common daisy was about that big. Oxide daisy, the flower, tends to be about that big. But otherwise, it's similar. You know, yellow centre, white um, kind of ray for its petals, white petals on the outside. But now it's it's just kind of down, down in the grass. Um, this was growing among, amongst the grass and. Oh yeah, you see purple 
kind of hairy stem. And we'll see it again. Now, I should say that although we, we, you know, we commonly, many members of the, the daisy family as wild, wild plants, I think of dandelions, which we'll be talking about, um, oxide daisy, that there, there are some people, and I was reading the other day, it's about, I think it's about 1.5% 1, 1 of people that have an allergy to members of, of this family. So that is something to be aware of. Um, often it can be kind of through, through contact. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's worth just, use the site I, I mentioned, Plants for the Future, and, and often it will, it will say if that, that, that's, that's an issue. But yeah, just to be aware that some people are sensitive, and you might know that you are to members of the daisy family, so you can just rule some of these out if that is an issue for you. But oxide daisy, really delicious. There's loads of other things that you can do with this plant um, later on as it, it goes through different transitional um, moments in its growth cycle but we'll talk about those when the time arises. So I'm going to put some of these in the salad too. Now here's another one. Let anyone guess what that is? Let's see it a bit more clearly. Go on, have a guess. I wonder if anyone knows. So, this is a plant of yeah, I often I often find this around kind of arable land, around kind of field edges and, and things like that. Uh, here it's just growing in the garden amongst the common sorrel, um, actually the oxide daisies as well. But it, I, I find it's a plant that tends to see more on the edge of kind of um, urban places rather than kind of right out in the country usually. And it's member of the cabbage family and it looks a little bit like watercress and it tastes a lot like watercress actually and it's called wintercress so see it's got alternate kind of leaf growth off the main flowering stem that means not opposite like opposite would be like, like alternate would be like that so nothing there, no, nothing, nothing opposite right there. It's got alternate leaf growth, um, and it actually has like yellow flowers which open kind of like a cross. And look, it's my first. I was rushing around to see if I could get you. So this is what it looks like when it's in flower, which will be, I would say, in in about maybe a month. Fire. Wintercress, Barbaria vulgaris. Mm. That's a whole load of description there, but anyway, I'm not going to get get into that. I could read that, but I, I won't. Maybe another time. In fact, another time I'm going to talk very much about skills of identification. But now, because um, it's just quite ambitious to both make a salad and cook something, I'm just going to take you through kind of just visually show it showing you. So there we are. Wintercress. Very much like actually American landcress which you, you might get seeds from and, and grow as a vegetable. Very 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 similar and you can use them, use them interchangeably. Um, really pungent flavour. Really pungent flavour. Oh hi C, look you scrolled out so I'm learning all the time. Nice stuff, wintercress. Rocket, I'm guessing rocket. Well, no, it's not rocket. Rocket's also a lovely pungent wild green that we, we could get. So yeah, it's used similarly in terms of flavor. So I'm gonna put some of that in the salad. 
When I'm making a wild salad, what I often like to do is balance pungent flavours with mild flavours. And the mild flavours, I think, thinking of things like hawthorn leaves, which I'll come on to in a minute, um, lime leaves, not citrus lime, but tilia species, the lime tree, which uh, it's not, not in leaf just yet, but it's coming very soon. Yeah, this basically tastes just like watercress. I think I should say something about that, actually, is I could have gone the other day to get some wild watercress, but because I'm putting it in a salad, I decided I wouldn't do that, simply because there's a whole kind of issue around not just watercress, but any plant that's growing in water or very near water. Um, having cysts of liver fluke on there. But this plant, which doesn't, which grows in much drier situations, it's not a plant that grows in water, it's not going to have that issue. So, you know, watercress is brilliant, but I wouldn't generally put wild watercress into a salad. I'd cook it and make soup out of it and use it as a vegetable. But yeah, I probably wouldn't put it raw into a smoothie or into a salad, that's watercress, but wintercress I would. So all these things I'm tossing on the ground, we, we just decided the other day where I live at my house here yeah, that we would uh, start having a communal veg stock pot. So actually I'm going to use those stalks for that so they don't get wasted. Right, what's next? Next, so again, I've done something that I wouldn't normally do, which is uproot a plant, but I did that so I could show you the whole plant, um, and it was growing in my garden, so I can get away, get away with it. But yeah, uprooting plants are generally not not good unless you planted them yourself. I mean, just for more obvious sustainability. Once you've uprooted it um, completely, it can't, can't continue growing. I mean, there's some plants, I mean, we, we talked about rocket just a minute ago. Um, wild rocket, I, I found that if before, like midsummer, even if you cut the plant right down to the base of the roots, not taking the root, but right down to the base, it will still grow. And things like dandelion. here is a lovely plant and an excellent salad item and I'll show you a leaf it's called got several names I expect there's all sorts of regional names as there are for a lot of these plants it's called garlic mustard which is a nice name in the sense that it gives a hint of its flavor like hints of garlic hints of mustard now the other name I, I love about for it is Jack by the Hedge because that gives a hint or more than a hint it kind of tells you one of the places where it grows so it, it likes to grow under kind of hedges now obviously a lot of the time hedges can be by the roadside so you have to be careful with that but it does grow it's, it's very common just kind of field edges um, the edge of, kind of bridle paths in, in a quite sunny location dappled sun um, full sun as well and veins on the other side so let me show you look here we are it's just that's the you see the flower buds there not opened yet we could eat we could eat just eat those as they are um probably pickle them that'd be quite nice I want to get you that. so i'm going to show you it's only the second plant i I'm going to show you what it looks like in flower. It's another member of the cabbage family and it's one of those wonderful plants where this happens quite a lot and if you've been on one of my courses you might have even been lucky enough to witness this happen is identifying plants not by um, their visual appearance or necessarily where they grow but by there we are that's it in flower white flower 
kind of open, four petaled, opens like a cross. Yeah, is identifying plants in terms of the other plants, sorry, the, not the other plants, but the other creatures that, uh, that, that kind of work with that plant, use that plant, need that plant for, for their life cycle. And the, and the thing I have in mind is the orange tip butterfly. So, so often I'm walking along with a group of people or just myself and I'll see an orange tip butterfly, which is like a, it's like a, it's like a, I think of a cabbage white butterfly, but about half the size. Um, and on its, the tips of its wings, it's got, uh, yeah, orange tips, really distinct orange tips. So you kind of see this flying around and I've been with groups and I've said, ah, look, orange tip butterfly. That means there must be garlic mustard within, I don't know, I reckon within 50 meters of where we are right now. And I've never said this without it actually being true. So um, we sometimes follow the butterflies and we can find the garlic mustard. But also that helps illustrate really well and I should say thank you to the butterflies because um, it was butterflies and moths that got me into wild foods in the first place. But yes, but it, it illustrates really well how when we're thinking about gathering wild plants that yeah, just because you can forage something doesn't mean that you necessarily should. Um, but certainly it means think about the other creatures and animals that might be using that plant so kind of don't take everything. What I'm a big fan of is uh, gathering seed and growing the plants and then putting them out in the same location. Obviously that can happen naturally itself, but I think you give an extra, um, yeah, an extra possibility for the colony to be strong if, if you are doing that. You also early, perhaps in London it's later. What are you referring to, Teresa? Um, not sure. I would say, as a general point, anything in London is usually earlier because it's a bit warmer. Uh, so garlic mustard, unless it's super young. Oh, the other thing I was going to show you is, yeah, garlic mustard you might be seeing right now might look much more like this. So really quite small. This was growing kind of in the shade. And then this one was growing in dapp dappled shade, actually quite, but quite sunny kind of dappled shade. Hence, it's a bit more advanced. We've got a tiny little flower cluster coming there as well. So the stems of these, of, of the, the main flowering stem is quite, you can, you can see, I, I tend to, to use my fingers a lot and not just kind of, you know, slice things, things off with it with a knife because then you can see where it's tender. Um, you know, often fingers are the best tool, so the stem is tender from there. Uh, but the leaf, the leaf stems don't tend to be kind of main flowering stem, at least in the early stages of growth before the plant flowers, tends to be nice and tender some way down from the top, not from the base. So there we are. The flowers are edible as well. They're really nice. Has any, any of you seen um, small orange tip butterflies flying around in the Kind of early spring. I haven't seen any yet, but I think kind of more May time. So. Yep, this is also garlic mustard, Aliaria petiolatris, it's botanical name. botanical name. It's one that you can make pesto with as well, nice pesto. Either on its own as the main wild ingredient, or yeah, you could put wild garlic, you could put nettles, various other things, but it works well on its own. Jack by the Hedge, yours is huge, absolutely it's small in our woodlands. Now, I've just shared your video with my son. We are here talking about garlic mustard yesterday, so I was happy to see. Yes, happy to see. I'm, I'm so glad you're happy to see because I think when you work with wild foods for wild plants for a long time, or even a short time, is that when you see them coming 
for the first time in, in the season. It really is like seeing friends. So I even have my mouth just going, I'm getting something else. And I, like the other day, it was about a month ago now, I saw some coltsfoot flowers when I was making something else. And I, I just kind of waved and I said, ah, hello. You know, it's just a, a sunny greeting with the lovely yellow flowers. So I'm going to take you know, the leaves off. I would say actually that garlic mustard is one of those plants where, well, when I go out foraging salad leaves, I normally have, I mean, it's not so relevant when I'm doing it just around the house, but if I'm going further afield, I usually take, well, I've got some here, I usually take polythene bags simply because some plants can wilt really, really a lot, and garlic mustard is one. So, got that. Next one, just talk very briefly because we talked about it a lot. Yes, well, a lot we talked about it suddenly yesterday anyway, which is wild garlic. Um, and look, just in there, we've got a, we've got a little bud coming. And I'll show you the, the wild garlic buds that I've been salting up. I'm going to put on as a garnish at, at, at the end. So, wild garlic, you can eat raw, you can eat cooked. Um, the stems, you can use all parts of the harvest, even the seeds, the immature seeds. Uh, a friend of mine, it was kind of, this is kind of quite devastating, she only told me this a few weeks ago, was that I was like kind of ho horrified. She's telling me that she was like having real, she'd had real trouble last year trying to eradicate the wild garlic from her garden and uh, had dug up so many bulbs, like she'd dug up a whole like bin and send them to landfill. Um, yes, can you imagine? That's just so disturbing. Oh, look, I touched my face. I, ah! Don't touch your face. Um, so, yeah, what a missed opportunity. Could have got those bulbs and given them to people, um, spread them around, kind of property where I am. But it didn't happen. But next time I touch my face again, should I just get it over with? No, touch my face. Don't, don't touch your face. Right, I'm going to eat the salad as well, as well, because I touched my face. Um, so the next thing we're going to look at is this one. We looked at it yesterday. Uh, it's a nice little cluster. In fact, I haven't, I haven't labelled this in the book, but I'm just going to look it up. And by the way, if you see me using this book, this is one that... Look, obviously you can see, I've used this a lot because the colour's gone, so what is it called? It's called the Wild Flower Key uh, by Francis Rose. And let's just look up this, which is Ribwort Plantain, so I can show you a picture of it when it is in flower. Um, Plantago... Yeah, so this is one I use both as a salad green and a vegetable. And there's just so much of it in my garden. 387. 387. So this is not a guide to wild foods as such, but it is a very helpful guide to identifying plants. There we are. That's it there, at a later stage. You might be familiar with those kind of beautiful flowers that, that kind of ripen open from the bottom. And then you, you, can, you, can, you can flick them and the, the pollen just goes in a kind of cloud. Ribwort plantain. And we talk about using those in when, when the season comes. It's not there yet, but other parts of this plant can be used at different stages. So the leaves are nice and tender at the moment. 
Uh, someone says you about wild garlic. You only need a few bulbs as they take as they take and spread quick. But as long as you keep eating, they will never take over. Um, huh. True. So there we are. Let's put some of those in the salad. That's what I found this morning. Ooh. We'll talk about those in a bit. I'm going to fry those with the, the dock um, kind of thing I'm going to make. So next is, and so I've got an example of what we're going to put in a salad and what we're not going to put in a salad. I mentioned this actually more than briefly yesterday, but I'm going to mention it again and we'll see why. I have kept them separate, not even like next to each other on the same table. Because even I, you know, with years of experience, can still make mistakes by sometimes not separating things um, safely and carefully. So, actually, let's, uh, so what I'm going to put, just because there's lots of it in my garden right now is and I picked a whole plant again so it was kind of growing in the grass and look you can kind of see it's in the dot family okay. comparing it to the other leaves looking down um, interesting so yeah, this is common sorrel, some more common sorrel with that double, I'm going to put it by my nose, can you see that double kind of notch, oh there we are, that shiny bit of my nose, can you see that kind of double like notch there at the end, it's kind of quite subtle. So what we don't want to muddle that for. This is good and edible. I must say, like, there's not not all, but a lot of wild plants come with a qualification, which is like why I I encourage you to look at that site, plants for a future. Um, it's that in circum cer some circumstances they might not be good for you. So so this is one that's quite um, high in oxalic acid, which is gives it a wonderful sharp um, kind of brambly apple skin flavour. And you know, in, in small quantities in a salad, it's just gorgeous. But, you know, there are situations where you might want to use this in larger quantities, for example, in soup or like it's a classic sauce that you can make to go with with fish, particularly white fish. Um, you know, if you really like that, yeah, you might want to eat it quite a lot, uh, particularly in the spring. But I guess if you suffer from gout or kidney stones, then that's one to be careful of because it can aggravate those kind of conditions. But it's one of those things like, like if you know that you... If you instinctively don't like rhubarb, right, um, have you ever wondered why? Or you know you can't eat rhubarb because this also has um, water-soluble oxalic acid. If you know that you're sensitive to that, go very easy on um, common sorrel or wood sorrel or any of the edible sorrels. So, yeah, the thing that we have to be very careful to distinguish it from is this other plant. And I deliberately went and got so this look at look at those so, so the one in this hand is absolutely not edible um, lords and ladies and it doesn't have that double double notch at the bottom and it, it, the, these were growing right next to each other um, in the grass although one is more woodland edge species and one is more um, grass grass species growing in kind of kind of arable land and just grass in your garden which is the sorrel yeah don't they look so similar um, I know quite a few people that have mistaken these two leaves um, so I would encourage you to look at guides online resources and compare these and particularly um, do you know what I would like to do I'm I'm, I'm not gonna do it um, extensively I'm just gonna show you actually yeah so the other thing about the not edible one, it's called um, 
Lords and ladies, arum maculatum. Right? But that's it when it gets bigger, and then it looks nothing like sorrel. But the maculatum part is like the spotted bit. But you can see, like, not all the leaves are spotted. When they are, it's really obvious. Like, even in a young stage, if it's a variety, or um, not variety, but if it's one that is spotted, even at the young stage, it'd be spotted. But you can see that one isn't, so it looks a lot more like sorrel. But I encourage you to look up the um, precise botanical details to look at the difference. Um, Lords and ladies is shiny, says um, Alex. Yes, it, I, it tends to be a, a little shinier and, and, and glossier, but there's, there's many, many, many different features. And I just wanted to show you a, a, a book that, if you're not a botanist, it can be quite challenging. Um, if you wish you were a botanist, it's absolutely wonderful. And it's called, you see, The Vegetative Key to the British Flora. And importantly, look at the, the new second edition. And it will have really detailed descriptions of the plants. And if some of the terminology is unfamiliar to you, it's got a great glossary. And the other thing I like about it, look, it's a bit of geek geekiness, like that arrow shaped bottom of a leaf is um, sagittate, sagittate. I say it like that because it's just such a lovely word to say. And a lot of um, it's unusual terminology is just all the, the joy of learning new words. And yeah, it has look all whole section with loads of leaf shapes in real detail. Pretty good. So highly recommend that. Um, but certainly a challenge if you're not a botanist, but really, it's a really nice um, gateway to particularly identifying plants. Um, the reason it's called the vegetative key, by the way, is it's identifying plants when they're not in flower, which is from a salad point of view, or spring vegetable point of view, that's exactly when you want them. And it can be hard um, to identify the plant. Uh, when it's not in flower, unless you've got a, a really good guide. I touch my face again. At least I'm becoming aware of it. Um, so the next one we have is. What am I doing for time? I said I was going to cook, cook something as well. I don't know. You can't see the time on my phone now. But anyway, it doesn't matter. So we've got two here, and one which needs no introduction really. This is the thing, I can't assume that you know anything. I mean, it's, it's strange doing this because I'm going to have people on here and I, I see a lot of my foraging colleagues that have a lot of experience and those of you that really don't know much about wild food at all, if, if anything. Um, but we have dandelion here. Got the flowers of dandelion, which I'm going to put in a salad. So all parts of the dandelion are edible. Um, throughout the year there's always something you can get from dandelion. So again I've kind of dug up whole plants. These are in my garden so no issue with digging them up. So we could use the roots to roast roast up for, for coffee. Um, you could dry them first and then roast them or you could roast them straight from fresh which you get more kind of like a caramelized flavor if you do that. Uh, what I liked about these ones is um, dandelion is one of those plants that has so many kind of natural variations um, that it's incredible. But one really distinct variation on, on these two plants, look at that. So this is why when you're identifying plants never just go on one feature alone because you know here we have which has a central kind of rib or vein that's kind of purpley red and you know, this one doesn't at all. But, yeah, if you look at the kind of growth, growth form, um, and if you were looking in a guide, it would describe all, all that, and what, it, what it means. Uh, you know, they're both, they're both the same. They're both the same. But we've just got some lovely natural variation going on there. So I'm going to tear that off. Oh, look, I can see some, some of the buds in there. Look, you see those? They're great for um, pickling, actually. It's quite a labour of, of love. 
because you have to pick off, well you don't have to, but I tend to pick off all, all the, all the, these green bits, the calyx, like underneath, so they look more like capers, like, and then you end up with something like that. But now, now it's like the ideal time when they're really dense in bud. So put some dandelion leaves in there, in the salad. It's funny, earlier on I was thinking, oh, you know, I haven't got many salad things. Um, but it's often the way, you just get a few plants and look, it's, it's, there's loads. So the next one I'm going to show you is one that can wilt a little bit. So it's hawthorn. Hawthorn is just coming out in all the hedgerows now. And so yeah, there we are, hawthorn. So these leaves, they stay tender for, I mean, growing on the plant from, from germination of, 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 of the, or germination, can you say that about leaves? Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, I just, I'm just budding, just starting to, to grow from that point. And then I would say for about two weeks, they stay nice and tender. Um, after that, they kind of put down quite a bit of cellulose and they're still edible, but they're not as enjoyable to eat. Um, so I've got some leaves of hawthorn. Um, it's another one that doubles as, as medicine. It's one of those medicines which I kind of really like because, um, take some more leaves off there. It's, and you can, you can look up like herbally and I, again, I, I recommend the site Plants for a Future or any good kind of herbal book for looking at the medicinal herbal sides of foods, but good for regulating blood pressure, high and low, and and good for the heart in various ways. I've used it to treat a minor um, irregular heartbeat years ago, it worked a, a treat. But um, herbally, when you think of wild foods that can be used herbally as well, uh, you've got to be careful about the quantity you're having. But the thing I like about hawthorn is, um, as far as I'm aware, like, you know, you can eat a lot without getting into any problems, any issues whatsoever. So I'm going to put those in there. But the other thing I really like today is, and I don't have to resort to the book to show you this plant in another stage of growth. Now this is this is highly unusual, I must say. I've not seen this before. So I work extensi extensively with the berries of the hawthorn. Now the, things, the ones you're almost likely to see are common hawthorn, midland hawthorn. They could be high hybrids. I touch my face again. Um, or... Um, yeah, other, other ornamental varieties that are planted out, also edible. But it's really unusual to see berries at this time of year that are still really firm um, and the leaves just coming out. Like, I, to be honest, I've never seen that before, like in 30, 30 years of origin. So I was kind of excited to see that this morning. But yeah, that's the plant. Um, actually, it's a little bit misleading simply because I think some of the fruit has, has been dropped off. Typically, it's in, they hang down in clusters of, you know, three, even up to kind of as much as, as many as ten. Look at that. So hawthorn's coming out everywhere at the moment, certainly down south. In the salad. Done that. Um, foraging colleagues, there's often this debate, um, and it, you know, I don't know who's a beginner here, who's got a lot of experience, but it's members of the carrot family and talking about those. Because, you know, there's good edible ones like this, which is cow parsley, and then we've got poisonous things like hemlock, um, hemlock water drop water and all the rest of it. So, possibly if you are very new to wild food, some of the more obviously carroty members 
of the carrot family, particularly if you're on your on your on your own or you're just working with guidebooks. I touch my face again. Okay. I like this. It's like it's like you know a Zen meditation where as soon as you lack whack, lack ah, as soon as you uh, lose awareness of what you're doing, someone allegedly comes and whacks you with a wooden board, so you come back into awareness. So, um, but anyway. Be careful of members of the carrot family, but I will just say uh, in this one that compared to hemlock, hemlock has, no, I'm talking here, when, when I'm, I'm talking about identifying this particular feature of the stem, I'm not talking about the main flowering stem, which is always vaguely round, but the leaves that are coming off the flowering stem. So in um, cow parsley, this is a quite a deeply grooved stem. Like imagine you can imagine a little elf sliding down that groove. Like whee! You see it? It's like deeply grooved. Um, and hemlock isn't. Hemlock is kind of round and a little elf wouldn't have any slide to go down. If you get out at dawn and dusk, you might even be able to see them doing that, it's, I'm told. Uh, the other thing is it's hairy, like really small, even sized hairs. Now, some of the guidebooks will say more or less hairy, so you can get ones that really don't have much hair at all. And I tend to avoid those just because they can be muddled for other things as well. So really subtly hairy. And one thing I like to do, if you can't feel that, if you put it to your lip, it's like, oh, you can feel it. It's really itchy and annoying, but you can kind of feel those hairs. Um, lots of other features that distinguish it as well is that um, on the stem, we have a kind of uniform colour. Now sometimes yeah, it can it can graduate from kind of a purplish at the bottom um, and then going to green, but it's never blotchy. Um, so uh, yeah, hemlock is kind of purple blotches, hence maculatum. Um, Connie maculatum is, is hemlock. And we've, we've mentioned the term maculatum already in terms of Um, hemlock, it's kind of purpley red blotching. Uh, yes, they can grow right next to each other. Uh, this one tends to come in, which is this one we're talking about, which is cow parsley, or Friscus sylvestris, some people call it wild chervil, um, comes into flower earlier than uh, hemlock. However, that's generally, there's always plants that are just going to decide to flower out of season because that's just their whim. So you have to kind of acknowledge and respect that too. So anyway, cow parsley, perhaps not for very beginners or for beginners, but only I'm um, gathered with someone that's really experienced with members of the carrot family would be my recommendation. So there we are. And we're almost done with the salad now before I start cooking. And what I'm going to cook is both the dock leaves and these St. George's mushrooms. But the last couple of salad items are plants that are in the garden. And actually, I'm just going to add some oil first to the salad. It's a bit of local um, Seed oil. Oil good as well. What do you reckon? Local lemons? Now, where is the knife? A new chaos within the shoe. Ah, look. See, I put it down under the dock leaves. No, not no local lemons. However, there is a plant. If you were, if you want to, if you want to get a lemon flavour, just like lemon juice, but you don't have lemons, you could use a plant you might have in your garden, which is called uh, Rus typhina or Staghorn sumac. Now, the, the the berries of that you can, in, from August onwards, you can gather and you can strip off the kind of woody stems and just mash them up with water. And you get something which essentially tastes 
really just like lemon juice, except it's pink. Um, so you could use that instead of the lemons in a salad dressing. The other thing I'm going to put on there is some, some garnishes, both wild and non-wild. Got some primrose flowers, flower flowers. Is. I've never said that before. I've got some like sheeps and fishes. I got some primrose primrose flowers. I'm going to put in that. Now some people might not be a, a fan of flowers and salads, but I just think it makes it really cheery. Of course, has to be uh, our garnish at this time of year. Of course, is gorse because it rhymes with of course. And gorse, look how thorny that is. Ooh, that was hard to pick this morning. And again, normally I wouldn't have just chopped that off. I just would have picked a few flowers, but I wanted to show you. So this is like often just going out. Um, yeah, on kind of heathland, kind of places like that. This is just growing at the end of the garden, just beyond the garden actually. Pick those off. It's a member of the pea family. You can make excellent wine with it, by the way. Really excellent wine. And on a sunny day, it's just an absolute joy to smell the gorse. Um, carefully, because you don't want one of those prickly things in your eye. Um, and just the delightful aromatic kind of coconut perfume that kind of wafts, wafts up, particularly when it's sunny. The bees are really into it as well. So some gorse flowers. Gorse tea, of course, really good. Gorse flowers. Now, this was an exciting moment this morning. I saw the first of the wild garlic buds, but that one's just about to burst open. And these ones are just opening. Wild garlic flowers. Oh, isn't that lovely? Ah, oh, good. Conversations going on between you. Thanks, Spaz, for thoughts. So, put those on there. Another member of the cabbage family is called cuckoo flower or lady smock. Very pungent um, leaf, very kind of ooh, kind of mustardy, kind of cressy, but the flowers are good, good too. This kind of grows. Um, what is this? Oh gosh, what is the botanical name? This? Uh, cardamine pretensis, I, I think. Yeah, pretensis meaning of the meadow. Um, so often in damp meadows, particularly, well, obviously now it's going to start happening, but usually I, I typically see this in flower in May, but sometimes you can be driving by a, a damp meadow, cycling by, walking by, and you just see like the whole place covered in, in these, which are flowering. Lovely, but they're flowering now and they're delicious. You can eat the leaf as well. And almost the final garnish, a plant I use a lot. Now, this is the first non-wild plant I'm talking about. And it's one of those things, and it's not true. I talked about um, um, staghorn sumac, which isn't a wild plant, although it is naturalized in some places, particularly down in the southeast. So this one here is a Berberis darwinii. Darwinii, I just like saying that. Things with double I, I like to say, so I'm going to say it again. Uh, Berberis it's got one eye, three eyes. Berberis darwinii, double eye. Um, what's its common name? Often my, I, you know, my, my mind is so full of kind of wild food things that sometimes I, I can either remember the common name or the botanical name, but not both at the time. Um, and I've just gone blank. Um, anyway, you often see it um, in people's gardens or it might be kind of, kind of hedging the edge of people's gardens. And it's such a wonderful plant. It has, again, it's got 
um, oxalic acid flavours. I think it must be oxalic acid because it's got hints of that kind of sorrel flavour in the flowers. But also, particularly when they come out, the flowers come out, there's a hint of sweetness as well. Um, yes, yeah, someone remind me what the common name of this is, please. Um, Darwin's Barbary. Ah, oh, thank you. Touch my face again. Um, Darwin, Darwin's Barbary. So it's, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous um, colour. The leaves, you would, uh, I don't know if they're edible. You certainly wouldn't want to eat them because they're like really thick and, and, and spiky, like a bit like holly leaves. But the flowers, good and edible. Look, it almost looks like a tiny little um, daffodil. Never noticed that before. You see that? It's daffodil like, isn't it? Um, but then you've also got these little clusters when they're closed, which really pickle very well. Like cold pickled, ideally, or overcook them. Uh, I make a lovely syrup with these as well. It's kind of orange and and, um, and sharp and sweet because obviously you've added sugar. So Darwin's Barberry flowers. I'm going to put those. There's my almost final garnish. I'm going to add the final garnish after I've cooked with the dock and shown you how to cook with dock. So, oh, by the way, this has a lovely fruit as well. It's like it's a bit, maybe about the size of a bilberry, a little bit smaller which uh, ripens later in, in the year. Yep, so the feed cut out then, but here we are, I'm back. There it is, not quite finished, but almost there. So, now, cooking with Doc. If you've just joined, or I think this is the, the, the bit I'm looking forward to most. If, you, if you're thinking, God, he's been talking about wild food for an hour, I can't take much more. Um, do hang around if you can to learn about how to cook with dock. Because, yeah, again, any good guidebook will tell you the identifying features for dock. So I'm just going to kind of show you here because I know that a lot of people are familiar with dock as, you know, we all learn that when we get stung by a nettle we take the dock and rub rub the, the stung part to relieve it. Whether that's true or not, I'm not sure. I know plantain is supposed to be better than that. But I also read that just rubbing the area can bring relief just because of the act of rubbing increase, increases kind of lymph flow to the area. Um, who knows? Anyway, so what I'm going to do is, so you see that if I hold it up that way, because because I'm basically what I'm what I'm doing now is I'm going to use common dock as you might use vine leaves. But um, unless you've got a lovely conservatory and you're growing a grapevine, um, you're not going to have much access to, to, to vine leaves. So this is a, a wonderful alternative, and I think these are better because they're, they're they're bigger. So there we are. It's got. Uh, and oh, also, look, because we're going to talk about this later, the beautiful pattern of the veining, like on the other side. Oh, someone's asking, what was the name of the plant that you could use to replicate lemon? Um, that was staghorn sumac berries, when you get them in kind of August, September, ideally. So I'm going to cut that vein off, that central vein, from the back, using a sharp knife. You get to a certain way and then you can just pull it actually, but um, be careful that you don't pull off the side veins that we're doing that. Sometimes it's easier just to use a knife to go all the, all the way. Um, and now the reason for doing this is so it becomes easier to use as a wrap. So, we are. could eat that, but it's just, now look, we've got this floppy, floppy leaf. So, there we are. Floppy dock leaf. Now, generally, we don't put. We could. We could put some. You, you know, if you don't mind quite tannic flavours, and uh, you could put dock leaves just straight into a salad. And what? If, yeah, I'm talking about common dock. Uh, where is the chopping board? The, the, oh, there they are. So, you you could, but. To my palate, it's not very nice. It's a bit dry and astringent. There are docks, such as Greek dock, um, that you could put straight in the salad. Another member of this family is called Bistor, Bistors, um, which particularly grows more northern, kind of lake district around 
culture that kind of way, which is a member of the dock family, which you could use straight off. But this one requires just a little bit of, whether well, well, you're using it as a vine leaf or as a vegetable. So what I've done here, I've, I've taken out the, the central vein and I've cooked these for about two minutes. So in, in boiling water, um, actually I did it for a minute, I threw away the water and then I, um, I put it in fresh water and boiled it again. It probably wasn't necessary, but I did that. So now we've got, look at that, look at that lovely vein structure. So at this point you could go kind of the Greek way and you could, I never know how to, I was looking up this word like earlier and I'm going to ask you, but actually I can't ask you here because you're just exactly, someone just said Doc Dol, Dalmades, Doc Dal maids, how you pronounce this? But anyway, that's what it is, um, use, using vine leaves. So that's typically with rice, like herby rice, with kind of onions. And so you could go that way. I'm going to do a very, very similar thing. And what I'm going to do is stuff them. I was just, I was just being resourceful this morning. I just kind of looked around like the cupboard. I had a tiny bit of risotto rice I left over and need using up. And I also had a There we are. I also had something as slightly bizarre, which was a whole load of uh, chicken that a friend of mine, she was making bone broth and was so kind of fixated on the idea that the good part of making a bone broth was like the bones that she got a load, she had a load of chicken bones and added in, I was boiling those those up, and added in a whole chicken, a whole lovely organic chicken as well. And, you know, cooked this like overnight. And then to my astonishment, decided, like squeezed it all through a cloth, but was throwing away all the chicken meat. Like, now, I found that very surprising simply because for me, like making something wonderful as like a bone broth is using something that typically some people might throw away. Look, I'm just making those into little rounds. Uh, it's not like about getting a chicken and then cooking it and throwing away the meat. Now it is true that the meat didn't have much flavour by the time she squeezed all the all the juices out of it, but I got it and I blended it and I stuck it in the freezer with a view to making burgers with it at some point. To that end, I've, I've, I've got a whole load of onions which I've dried. And it's not here, this is my plan. Um, some concentrated chicken stock, and I'm gonna just gonna mix it with the, the stuff I've got blended and frozen. Mushroom powder, chicken stock, salt and pepper, and make burgers out of it. But anyway, right now, I've got this mixture of and a rice and discarded chicken. Yeah. I'm putting in the dock leaf and actually just while I do that, no, I can do the mushrooms. And I'm just gonna fold this as best I can. Now it could be one leaf, it could be two. Yeah. Get a little squeeze. There we are. I'm going to pan fry these with uh, St. George's mushrooms, which we'll talk a little bit about in a minute. I think I'll make a couple of those. Just while I do that, I'm going to just put some oil in the pan. I'm so glad I... It's quite unusual for me to be organised enough to actually create a, a fire and some hot embers, like, in advance. have. The other thing I was going to do, while I was like searching through my supplies, I found a whole load of, uh, two things, I found a whole load of rendered down deer fat that I got from a roadkill deer and I found a whole load of um, pheasant fat as well, which I'd, I'd saved from a roadkill pheasant. 
So, you know, there's, there's alternative results, and we might talk about that on some future things, like utilising what I call accidental meat. Some people somewhat brutally call roadkill, it's not a term I like so much. It doesn't really seem to honour the animal much in any way. I just don't like the term, but anyway. Um, but I'm using oil, I'm using rapeseed oil just now. Actually, that's so hot. I'm going to take that off. And let's do another one of these. Now, I guess you could do, I never have done, I guess you could do sweet versions of this with, um, I don't know, rice, like risotto rice, like kind of done like rice pudding with, um, you know, chopped figs or dates or something in there. And then toss this in a pan with butter and honey. I'm just kind of making this up as I go along, but I kind of, I've got a sweet tooth, it's my default, so I start to fantasise and think about these kind of things when I'm, when I'm thinking about using any plant in a recipe. So yeah, a sweet version of this, but we're going for a savoury one at the moment. And, you know, there's a number of leaves that you can use for wraps. One of my, perhaps my other favourite leaf to use as a wrap, um, a lime, like tilia species, big lime leaves, which you could put raw in a salad, but they're, they're really nice for kind of wrapping wild pickles and um, kind of cheese, cheese in lime leaves. What else do I use as a wrap? Um, what else? Any ideas what other wild leaves we could use as a wrap? Obviously wild garlic could be used to wrap fish and, or rice or anything really, anything that you've made. So that's enough just for illustration. Squash that down so it kind of holds together. Yeah, so my understanding of, of making like on the Greek kind of stuffed vine leaves is you put the, I'll just show you, ooh, there goes one, is that you, is that you fill, not on, on the shiny side, which obviously it's not shiny anymore because I've boiled it and it goes this kind of unique kind of colour, but you would fill on that side so that when you wrap, you've got the lovely vein pattern on the outside. Um, that might be a little lost a little bit on this one because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pan fry it. Um, the other thing about using, actually were using vine leaves, is that you would often be like cooking them in, like braising them for quite a long time, possibly. Um, whereas if you did that with dock leaves, I, I suspect, I've never done it, you see, that way. I expect it to break down. Um, so I make sure everything's kind of cooked inside first and then either braise it for not very long or pan fry it. So, I think get the St George's mushrooms on first. Now, St George's mushrooms. Where is... Oh, yeah, yeah. See? There we are. So many books I'd like to recommend. Um, so Jeff Dan has got a lovely book called um, well, who knows what it's called, something like Edible Mushrooms, something obvious like that. But Jeff Dan's got a really good book, Forager's Guide to Mushrooms. But I'm really excited about this one because I love anything by Jeffrey Kibbe. Now, he has some photographic guides to particular um, genre, like the agaricus that we have field mushrooms in. Uh, but also the yellow stainer, which is, of course, is the most poisonous in this country every year. Uh, photographic guide um, to the Amanita genus, Tricholoma genus, what else? Um, milk caps and Rushula. But this one is his second of three volumes. Um, and he's just an amazing font of knowledge. And look at the gorgeous illustrations in this book, which he has illustrated himself. Unbelievable. So what we've got here is... A mushroom, which classic, classic spring mushroom, comes in spring, typically, um, hence its name, around St George's Day, which is 23rd of April. Now this was a really interesting cluster because for the first time ever I saw this mushroom growing 
on the 15th of January. Never seen that before. The earliest I've ever seen it is uh, March before. But anyway, it was growing on the 15th of January in the same place where I got these. So I went, cycled past it yesterday and I thought I'm just going to check it because it's, it's come out at such a weird time back in January. Like, will it come out again in the same spot? And well, it has. So I'm not really going to get too much into um, mushroom identification. But this one, sometimes you can identify mushrooms Apart from all the features that the mushrooms have, is that you can identify them by habitat, like grassland or woodland, or even a specific type of woodland. Um, even sand dunes could be growing in sand dunes. But this one, although it tends to grow in grassland and tends to grow in rings, doesn't always grow in rings, it doesn't always grow in grassland. Um, it can grow in particularly woodland edge as well. But yeah, it's described, so it has. Like, you know, look, I'm going to read the full description. Some of this terminology won't mean anything to you, but um, it's good to get to know. Cap, convex, and then expanded. So you can see it's kind of, it will expand a little bit. Uh, Fifty to 110 millimeters, margin in curved. Dry, smooth, pale cream to ochreous ivy. Gills, which is those structures underneath where the spores are. The gills are crowded, so really close together. Narrow and emarginate, we won't get into that. Right, the spores, white to pale cream. The stem, cylindrical to clavate, um, 30 to 90 millimetres times 10 to 30 millimetres, that's height of width. Fibulose, whitish flesh, firm. It is really firm. Fibulose and white. Odour and taste, farinaceous. Now it's interesting because, like, smell is really key to the identif identification of some fungi. But farinaceous, I mean, slight, slightly flowery. But it's also it, it's the, the sense of smell when it comes to identify. Oh, I've got a pan on the heat. Must come off. Um, sense of smell is quite subjective. Although I do often get kind of flowery overtones in this one. I, for me it smells of watermelon. That's what I, th I think of it as the watermelon mushroom. But maybe that's just me. But anyway, I'm going to chop that up. If I can find my knife. Have any of you seen me touching my face when I haven't been known, known that I'm touching my face? I saw this video this morning about why we like to touch our face so much. It was to do with, you know, you think people are like um, kind of shocked or, or all sorts of kind of quite emotional situations that it was describing it as a, as a form of self-soothing. Um, and it mentioned about, you know, touching particular kind of pressure points and that just kind of helps soothe us. But what I do, I've left them, I've left them under the camera. Uh, yeah, and it's kind of interesting that, isn't it? That that's why we do it. And now, when you know some of us might be a little bit distressed about being indoors or kind of isolated from others, and you know, hearing people's news, we might be doing a video call with someone, hear their news and the relation, kind of upset for them or each other. And we kind of just want to touch our face all the time. I'm just kind of using it at the moment as a kind of cue to kind of be more aware of what I'm doing. Because to be honest, I find that most of the time I'm just on autopilot and my lack of awareness is quite astonishing. Like I, th I think, I, you know, I like, I think, I, I, I'm, I'm so deluded. I like to think of myself as like really aware and observant as a forager. And I think, well, to a certain extent, I am, but it's like it just amazes me the amount that one doesn't notice. And you know, foraging has really helped hone that ability to kind of notice things. But um, you know, sometimes I just don't notice things. Like that, I posted a video to promote like these, get you interested in joining these of a of a tree I've been walking past for about four years and I just didn't realise it didn't have leaves, it was just covered in 
oat moss. Um, anyway, here we are. St George's mushrooms. Get those going for a little bit first. How high can I go without losing any? I lost some. Not very high is the answer. I'll put those in in a minute. I'm just going to finish off the salad with two more garnishes. One. One is the wild garlic buds that I was talking about, salt pickling the other day. They're not quite done there. They've got a, a day or so to go. But, no. First one with flavour. And the final thing is just a little bit of fun. Is fly agaric. I repeat, fly agaric. The red mushroom with the white spots. Radishes. Yes, not actual raw fly down. But it's a, I went to catering college, gosh, back in 1990. And the only thing I remember is being shown how to make fly garrick radish garnishes. So I shall show you this rubbish. Yes, indeed, surely the next app is to be able to taste, taste it too. Maybe, I don't know, it's happening. Interesting. Uh, so here we go. Got your radish and got your sharp knife. And you just kind of go round, but you don't cut all the way. You kind of meet where you cut the other side. You don't go all the way in. Then you are making the stem of the fly garrick mushroom. There we are. Just take the, 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 the real challenge here is, to, is that they stand up. Um, so right now we have what looks like a Rushula emetica. Um, we don't want that. We want a fly agaric Amanita muscaria. So first thing is take the, the little top bit off. Then with your knife, just make some little white dots. We, quite a few years ago, had the, the pleasure of uh, inviting Eston Blumenthal to my kitchen where I was living before. For, he was doing some filming for some series he was doing, and we were we were detoxing and cooking fly agaric, which is possible to do, the actual mushrooms. Um, so I made a fly agaric risotto. Don't ever do this, by the way, if you don't know how to detox fly agaric. Um, but yeah, and then I tasted it, and Heston said, how is it? And I did, I should have got an Oscar for this. I did my, my best impression of falling down, choking and falling down dead. Anyway. Unfortunately, I can't remember if it was Channel 4 or whatever, we're just too worried that this would be yeah, too controversial, so it was it was never used. So much safer just to use way fly agaric radishes. Mushrooms are done. My first, actually it's not true, it's not my first St George's mushrooms of the year, they were in January. So I'm really looking forward to this. Um, oh, do you know what? I even 
I even, I, I don't think I've ever been this organised in my life. I even bought a fork so I don't even have to go inside. I can enjoy this out here. So, I think that's a wrap for today. But yeah, if you've got any questions, there any questions? Let me see, I can go right to the bottom. So, someone said to me, go right to the bottom. And that's where you are truly mad. <laughs> Cheers. So, I hope you can get out and forage a bit or learn about wild plants. Um, don't be too anxious in these times. Particularly it's sunny, it really helps, doesn't it? Yeah, just stay connected. Connected to your friends, connected to the natural world and the foods that are around. And um, I'll post this on YouTube. I'll put some links to various things that I've mentioned. And I'll see you next time. So next time, I'm doing this um, Mondays and Thursdays, like every day for yeah, the foreseeable future while we're in kind of lockdown. So yeah, next time you could tune in if you'd like to, and I'd love to see you here, is uh, Monday at 10 a.m. So I'm going to go and quietly enjoy this. Have a lovely day. Bye. I'm not going to delete this either, hopefully. <laughs>